everyone. We're just 15 minutes away from the start of our worship service. My name's Eric Smith. I'm the executive pastor for ministries here at First Baptist Goldport, and I've got Lauren Mayfield with me, who is a brand new Mississippi State University grad. May is the month that we celebrate our graduates, and we're so proud of you, Lauren, and we're so proud of all of our grads. Dr. Stewart, our pastor, is going to continue his Jesus is Greater Than series, and he'll be talking about Jesus being greater than our sins. Yes, thank you, Eric, for having me today. I am so honored to be here and worshiping with you guys. I wanted to extend this that God is so like deserving and welcoming for us and we are here for y'all and I want y'all to be able to share this message with everyone and just be a part of this message this morning and yeah. Make sure you share us on Facebook. Get ready to worship. We're just about 15 minutes away.
just five minutes away from the start of our worship service. I'm Eric Smith, the executive pastor for ministries. I've got Lauren Mayfield with me, who's a brand new graduate of Mississippi State University. Yes, we're celebrating our grads in May, and we want you to get ready for an encounter with God. We've been praying for this moment, and we know that God is going to work as his word is preached, as his people sing, plan to engage in worship. Yes, and while we are getting ready, read the scripture on the screen. Get prepared, mentally be ready to engage with God's Word today. Um, we, we are here for you guys. Go on the FBC website. Get excited. We're excited, and we are about to worship with you guys.
good good day to you. We are so grateful that you are at First Baptist with us today. Thank you for allowing us to be in your living room. If you would stand where you are and sing with us. Singing, you call me. And you call me. You love me. You make me new again. And Jesus, you see us covered in righteousness. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at connect at fbcgulfport.org. God truly is at work, and he's going to continue to work as God's word is preached and as you engage in worship this morning. We're so excited to announce to you that our campus is beginning to reopen, and we're prioritizing life groups first. Four weeks ago, we began meeting with a group of leaders from our church family known as the Facility Reopen Task Force. And they've been working and planning and studying and gathering information to help us 
best determine how we can reopen our campus. And we've decided to prioritize life groups. Uh, May 20th, Pastor Jimmy and I, we put a message out on Facebook, on the church's Facebook page. If you'd like to see that video message, you can go to First Baptist Church Gulfport on Facebook and watch that short video because we want you to hear about how we're opening up our campus to life groups and to stay tuned as that continues to develop. Like I said, God has been at work during this pandemic. Our hope truly is in Him. And as a church family, we're committed to amplifying hope across this coast and around the world. And week after week, we've seen God work as He's drawn men and women into personal relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. And we've witnessed together several baptisms. And we have another baptism that we're going to worship through together. Justin Steiner, our student ministry intern, is going to baptize Alexis Vanderpoel. And we're really excited that as Alexis was baptized, she had a friend from Paraguay and a friend from the very northern part of Mississippi participating via Facebook Live. Continue to worship as we baptize. We're so grateful for you to be able to join us today and witness this baptism with us. So I just want to introduce you guys to Alexis. Um, Alexis has been a part of our young adult group for a couple of months now. And I met her the very first week that she came. I had no idea who she was or why she was there, but I was really thankful that she came. I was like, this is great. We have new people coming. This is a new opportunity. And so I just went with it and I just didn't even question it. But later I found out that she was friends with Victoria Jennings, who have been talking to her for months about the gospel and explaining Jesus to her and trying to get her to come. And finally, she came to our young adult group. And over the next two months, she got more involved, kept getting to know people better. And I got to know her better and found out she's a really great person. And it was really great to get to know her. And then last week, we were talking after, it was kind of after a lot of people have left. And it was just me, Victoria, Stephanie, and Alexis. And I was about to end the meeting and she said, wait, I have something I need to tell you. And so she told me in that time that she had found Christ and that she wanted to be baptized and that she was saved. And that it was an amazing night. We were all very excited to hear it. Might have cried a little bit, but it was such an amazing experience to be able to be a part of that, to be able to have watched that transformation happen, to be able to watch her grow like that. So Alexis, I have a question for you. Who are you going to follow for the rest of your life? Jesus, that's awesome. So, it's my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. So look, just touch, the, touch that to your tongue, and then take this candle, and that's representative that you are now the salt and light of Christ in this world. Will you guys pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for Alexis and for this time that we've gotten to share together. God, I thank you so much that I've gotten to be a part of her story and a part of what you've done in her life, God. I thank you so much for this time that we get to spend together, for you continuing to be glorified in all the things that we do. God, I pray that you'd be with us in this time through everything that we're doing, whether online, in person, all of it, God. And I pray that you could be, continue to be glorified in all of it. I pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. We're so proud of Alexis and the step that she has made to follow Jesus for the rest of her life. Maybe that's your story, or you need to make that your story. That's our prayer. That's the end goal today. Would you listen to these words as I sing them? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. He is the first, the last, the one who matters most. He is creator, ruling, sustainer.
Monday is Memorial Day. It is on this day every year that we celebrate those who made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could celebrate the freedoms that we have today. They stood side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and answered the call. They moved forward, advancing the ideas that everyone was free, everyone was created equal, Everyone has the right to pursue their own dreams, and that our nation was founded on those ideals. But not all of them came back. Some remained, never to go home, never to see their families. And some, we lost this side of the field of battle. They were sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, greatly loved. They charged forward for honor and peace and freedom. We acknowledge the empty space where we want them to be. Together we pay sincere tribute to those who fought for us. Those we remember, those we love. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for our military. Those who serve today, 
But this weekend, we remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for them. Thank you for their families. We ask that you bless them now. Thank you for the freedoms we have. May we use them for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy love was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to
thank you for this time that you've given us to praise you, worship you. God, we, we all come broken, Father. Not one of us is perfect. You sent your son to be the only perfect. And God, we ask that you help us use Jesus as an example of how we should live our lives. So please allow us to keep our hearts and our minds open as we hear your live word so that we can instill your presence in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What a great time of worship we've had. Thank you so much for worshiping with us and for hanging in there during this pandemic time of quarantine. Uh, we're really starting to kind of figure out some things in terms of the techno technological aspects of making sure that we are leading you in worship. And uh, I'm excited to bring the message and to focus as we continue the series, focusing on 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus is greater than. We've looked at the subject of fear, that Jesus is greater than our fear. We looked at the subject of doubt, that Jesus is literally greater than our doubt. In this message, we're going to look at the fact that Jesus is greater than our sin. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 reads this way, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There's so many things that are challenging us. Some are manifested in fear, some in doubt. One thing that everybody faces is sin. To understand what sin is and where it has come from and what God's plan is to deal with your sin. And to be reminded that Jesus is greater than our sin. He's greater than anything and everything. And 1 John 4, 4 reminds us that he's greater than the one who is in the world, Satan. The one who wants you to trip up under temptation to give in to sin. The one who wants you to rebel against God. The one who wants you to follow him as opposed to following God's plan for your life. There literally is a plan for your salvation. And we're going to unpack that together. And you cannot separate salvation from sin. For it's because of our sin that we need saving. That we need salvation. Jesus is greater than your fear, your doubt, your sin. He's greater than your fear in that he eliminates your fear. He satisfies your doubts. And Jesus forgives your sin. The fact that he can, does, and has forgiven sins makes him greater than your sin. Now many who would hear this message have followed Jesus for years of their life. Decades. This is the very basic message that brought them into this saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But we know during the season that as we invite people to worship with us, as we share and have watch parties that we're hosting with others, that we know people who have not yet come to understand that they have sin or that there is a plan from God to deal with their sin, or what happens if they don't choose God's way for dealing with their sin. And I want to make sure that from the Scripture, you and I are reminded, those who've trusted Jesus, what God's plan is to deal with our sin and what our steps, next steps are today. But I also want to make sure that people who may be hearing this message for the first time to come to understand how sin affects God and how sin affects our lives and how God has made a plan in Jesus for us to be forgiven of all our sins. The Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus never sinned. This is important for if Jesus is going to be greater than sin, then he can have never sinned himself. If Jesus is going to be able to forgive us our sins, it, it only makes sense that he would have never sinned. Jesus was the perfect offering on the cross. Sinless, as he hung there in your place and mine, 
giving his life so that we would not have to die, so that we would not have to pay that terrible penalty for sin in our lives. So the Bible teaches that Jesus never sinned. The Bible teaches that Jesus was tempted just like you and just like me. Jesus was tempted. He knows what temptation is. Without question, he knows what sin is because, like we said, he's greater than sin, so he understands it. He knows it fully and completely, what it does to you and why his father hates it. Not only has he never sinned, not only was he tempted like you are, he forgives sin. Very clearly, Jesus repeatedly forgave people for their sins. So many times in Scripture that he forgive people for their sins, it was a great foreshadowing of what he was going to do when he went to the cross, that he hung there to forgive you from your sins. He died so that you could be forgiven for your sins, so that you could live forever. There are key truths in Scripture, in this message, that deal with the subject of sin. First, it's that every person sins and is responsible for their own sin. I'm not responsible for yours, nor are you responsible for mine. Your parents are not responsible for your sin. Ah, They may have contributed to it, but ultimately, it, you have to own it. And because you are responsible for your sin, then you have to answer to God for your sin. Nobody else is going to answer for your sin. You'll have to do that. Yes, there could have been all kinds of influences in your life. You could try to blame it on a brother or blame it on a friend or some life situation or circumstance that you think was unfair. But the reality of Scripture is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are individually responsible for our own personal sin. This is an important truth to understand. You can't blame it on someone else. You can't pass it off to others. You're going to have to deal with it. How are you going to deal with your sin? Thanks be to God that in Jesus Christ, He made a way that you can deal with your sin by placing your faith and trust in the one who is sinless, in the one who forgives sins, in the one who hung on the cross so that you and I could be free from the penalty and punishment of sin. God punishes sin with death. It's very clear from the Garden of Eden, those earliest verses and chapters in the book of Genesis, that God set a plan in motion for, for us to live in this incredible relationship with Him, filled with peace and joy and happiness and, and no work or labor, and entered disobedience and sin. And then came death. The promise of death came as God gave instruction to Adam and Eve in the garden. Death wasn't immediate. It was eventual. But it comes to every one of us. And then the judgment. Why judgment? Because of our sin. And when you or I or anyone trust Jesus, He is our mediator. He is our advocate. He literally is our high priest. And the sacrifice so that we don't have to face the judgment or the penalty or the punishment for our sin. All of this equals Jesus being greater than your sin. Greater than your sin as he forgives your sin and offers you the gift of eternal life. Jesus can forgive your sin no matter what you've done. This is a common thing among people that I've heard from. Oh, I, you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know what I've done. No, I don't. But Jesus does. And he went to the cross to die for your sin, for every sin that you've committed. He died so that you and everyone else who's committed sin might be forgiven. You can trust him to forgive your sins. And if you've already trusted Jesus to forgive your sins, then you could join me in reading the Apostle Paul's words captured for us in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. In the message last weekend, we unpacked this verse and the very important step that someone needs to take before they can read these words, not as quoting someone else, but for 
yourself, to read these words for yourself from your heart that you really have done this, that you've trusted Jesus. Because what Paul understood is that when you trust Jesus as your Savior, then you can say with him these words, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't have time to unpack that like we did in last weekend's messages, but if you've not yet trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is a great place to camp out to come back and read and reread these words from Galatians 2.20 until you come to that place of saying, I need to be crucified with Christ. I need to live because he's living in me. The life I have in the flesh, I no longer want to live in sin. I want to live in faith, in faith in the Son of God, Jesus. Why? Because he is the one who loved me. And he is the one who gave himself for me. Jesus is greater than your sin. He's greater than anything or anyone you will face in this life. When doubt or fear or sin or need or pressure come knocking in your life, you have an advocate. You have someone who's been where you are. Jesus Christ, God's Son. He is the great high priest able to sympathize with your weaknesses because he faced them himself. You then need to hold fast to your confession of faith with confidence. Draw near to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Whether it be fear or doubt or sin or temptation that leads to sin. Because Jesus, the Son of God... He is the great high priest, and he's greater than he who is in the world. Jesus is greater than your sin because he came to give you life so that all who believe can be forgiven. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, we find this verse. Everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's the person of Jesus Christ. It's who he is. It's why he came to earth. It's why he went to the cross. Jesus is about forgiving sin. He's about forgiving your sin. Your responsibility is to believe in Jesus and to trust that his life was given for you. Jesus literally came to earth to forgive sin. Yes, he came to help us understand the kingdom of God was here. He, he came to repair our relationship with God. And hmm, that had both of those things have to do with the forgiveness of sin. Matthew chapter 1, 21. Speaking of Mary. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Now look at this last phrase. For he will save his people from their sins. Literally, the children of Israel were looking for a Messiah, one who would come that would forgive them of their sins, that would change their system of worship. Now, the religious leaders of the day weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They, they didn't see that he was the one they were looking for. They had shifted their thinking away from what the Scripture taught they were going to receive. And they had, in their own mind, created what they wanted. But Jesus was the one who came to save his people from their sins. I was thinking about this as I prepared this message that all of us have kind of a built-in survival instinct. We don't want to be hurt. We don't want to experience pain. And we certainly don't want to be killed or die. You and I will go to great lengths to avoid those things in our life, especially the last one. Why is that? Where does that come from? I believe God gave us the instinct to survive. This pandemic has thrown us curveballs, but like somebody told me earlier today, you can still hit a curveball. You may have to swing a little differently, wait a little differently, maybe receive some instructions. Listen, sin is a curveball that you cannot hit. Only Jesus can hit that one for you. And you've got to trust him to do it for you. 
Let your survival instincts point you to Jesus. Without Jesus, you're going to die in your sins. Without Jesus, you're going to face the judgment alone. Without Jesus, Jesus, you're going to receive punishment for your sins. Maybe you think you don't have sin. Maybe you think you're so good that you don't have anything wrong in your life. Well, we're going to address that as we walk through this message. The reality is, if you have that sense of, of I'm going to survive at all costs, well, read the scripture. Because this life is limited. Our time here is limited and we don't know from day to day what's going to happen. If we're going to get COVID-19 or we're going to get killed in a car road. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen later today or tomorrow or the next week. No day is guaranteed for you. But we are promised that we will die and then we will be judged. And you should have this sense of, man, I better get ready for that. One of the members here at First Baptist has shared with me several times a story about when he was a college student. And he heard the gospel presented. And his response to it was, sound like a pretty good deal to me. That Jesus would come to earth so that we could know God. So that we could understand sin. And so that through him we might see, receive forgiveness of our sins. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Trust Jesus. It's the only survival method made available to us by God. Otherwise you die and receive eternal punishment. Jesus is the only one who can forgive your sins. The only one who can give you eternal life. Listen, your sin is forgivable. No matter what you've done, no matter what you think about what you've done, no matter what somebody else told you about your sin, your sin is forgivable. There are those who've come to believe, maybe you're one of them, that you've done something so bad, so wrong, or somebody just told you, that's not a forgivable sin. But Jesus is greater than your sin. The scripture teaches there's only one sin that is unforgivable. It's referred to as the unpardonable sin. And it literally is to have a sense of God's Holy Spirit working in you. To bring conviction, to bring hope, to bring understanding. And attributing that, speaking and saying that it's not God's Holy Spirit working within you. But to be upset and to say that that's the devil working in you. To speak the opposite of what is true. And to literally speak blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God. And what happens is a person's heart becomes so hardened against God and their own sin that they are seeing black and saying it's white. And what the scripture's teaching is saying that a person who's gone to that place in their mind and their thinking and their words, they're not coming back from that. And if you've not gone that far, maybe you've done and said things that you regret Maybe you've done and said things that in your mind you've convinced yourself it's not a forgivable sin. But until you've hardened your heart so much against God that when you sense him working with your heart, you say that's Satan working. If you've not gone to that place, and if you're even thinking about it right now, you're not in that place. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you. If you're sitting there just contemplating, have I done that or not? You haven't. The person who's done that stopped listening to this sermon a long time ago. The person whose heart is that hard stopped, probably never started listening. So if you're still hanging in there with me right now, there's a softness somewhere there in you that's leaning in and wanting to know more about sin and about God and about Jesus and his love for you and what he did for you. And whatever you've done, whatever sin you've said, whatever your mom or dad or grandparent or teacher or boss or preacher said to you, ask the Lord to forgive your sin. Trust and believe not only that he can, but that he will. Because why? Because Jesus is greater than your sin. 
just ask him. He'll make it clear. Let go and let Jesus have his way with your life. And whatever sin is in your past or in your present. I want you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 8. This is a story about a woman who was caught in sin. And there were those who brought her before Jesus. And this story unfolds in such a beautiful way that it it helps us, I believe, captures for us Jesus' heart when it comes to sin. Verse 3, John chapter 8. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him. That they might bring some charge against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This woman's sin by the law was not forgivable. Go back and read the text again. John chapter 8. They brought her because the law said she should be stoned. But remember, Jesus is greater than your sin. He's greater than her sin. He's greater than my sin. And Jesus asked these guys a question. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. And the older left first, and then those all the way down in age. They knew that they were sinners too. They were trying to prove a point. But the greater point came from the one who is greater. Jesus forgave this woman of her sin. And yes, he gave her a directive, go and sin no more. Her sin was forgivable. He told her and he tells us when we ask for forgiveness, when we're in a position where we need to be forgiven, and everyone is, he tells us to go and sin no more. Sin ultimately is rebellion against God. Sin is when we turn our back on God's will or God's plan or God's directives for us. One of his directives is that we receive his son into our lives. To reject Jesus is itself sin. Augustine said, Sin is believing that you are self-created, self-dependent, and self-sustained. It basically... You take God out of the equation of your life. Dr. Stan Norman, who was a professor at Norland Seminary, now is the president of a Christian Baptist University in Arkansas. He wrote these words. We deceive ourselves if we believe that we can either minimize or eliminate the reality of sin simply by ignoring it or changing its name. We live in an age that strives to ease or eradicate moral or spiritual culpability, responsibility. To confess our sinfulness will painfully confront us with our shortcomings and even accentuate our guilt. Dr. Norman went on to write, The rejection of the biblical doctrine of sin does not invalidate its reality or power. Cornelius Plantinga Jr., he said that sin is the disruption of shalom. Now, we know very simply this word shalom means peace. Well, Plantinga goes further to explain what it is, and and he says sin is the disruption of shalom. He said shalom, he defines this way, is universal flourishing. Everybody wins. Universal flourishing, wholeness and delight. Shalom is a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied 
and natural gifts are fully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. What a beautiful picture of the Garden of Eden. What a beautiful picture of heaven. We're in between. What do we do? Our shalom has been disrupted by our sin. Help! It's Jesus. Jesus brings these two realities we've not yet experienced together in our life when he forgives our sin. That we come back into this right relationship with God as intended from the beginning, as portrayed in Genesis, and that we begin to live an abundant life in anticipation of the eternal life, and we bring that experience into our life now by the presence of the Holy Spirit living in us. And shalom, while it's not completely restored in the world around us, oh, yes, I'd love world peace. There's never going to be world peace. Not until Jesus comes back. But there's peace in here. And you know how you get it? When you ask Jesus to forgive your sins. He brings you back into that right relationship with God. He sends his Holy Spirit as a deposit and a guarantee for what's coming later. And the shalom that was disrupted by your sin is gone and removed. The punishment's no longer there because Jesus has forgiven you. Dr. Norman added, Among sin's many attributes, it creates death in the midst of life, evil in the midst of good, and corruption in the midst of purity. Without God's intervention, we are sinners who are truly zombies. Okay, no, he really didn't write that word zombies. He wrote these words. Without God's intervention, we are sinners who are truly dead men walking. Listen, don't miss this. Your sin will send you to hell. Your sin... Unforgiven by Jesus means that the judgment will be on you. If you trust Jesus, then when you leave this physical body and leave this earthly life and step into eternity, Jesus can say, he's with me. She's one of mine. They're forgiven. They're welcome to come in. There was a student who asked a preacher one time, he had a problem with sin. And he said to the teacher, You say that unsaved people carry a weight of sin. The student said to the preacher, I feel nothing. Tell me, preacher, how heavy is sin? Is it 10 pounds? Is it 80 pounds? And the preacher replied by asking the student, If you laid a 400-pound weight on a corpse, would it feel the load? The student replied, it would feel nothing because it is dead. To which the preacher replied, That spirit too is indeed dead which feels no load of sin or is indifferent to its burden or flippant about its presence. If you've not been forgiven of your sins, you are a dead man walking. And you probably don't feel that total burden. Now, God, by conviction, can bring that burden to you. And if he does, don't say it's the devil working. Ask God in Christ to forgive those sins in your life. Listen, it's really as simple as this. It's as simple as one, two, three. One, everybody is a sinner. And so there's a label on us, right? It's the scarlet letter of S. <laughs> We're all sinners, not Superman, sinners. There's one label center. There's two categories. Saved, not saved. There are three groups within these two categories under this one label. The first group is the group that by faith is trusting Jesus to forgive their sins. The third group, remember I told you there are three. I'll come back to the second one. The first group is those by faith who are trusting Jesus. Labeled as a sinner... Saved, 
because of their faith in Jesus and trusting him for the forgiveness of sin. Second, sinners not saved who have no faith and no desire for faith. Group three. Who's in group two? I thought you were asking that question. Group two are people that say, I'm trusting my good works. I believe that I'm a good person. I believe that I'm going to do enough good that even though I've done some bad, when I get to the end, God's going to look at me and say, oh, he did good enough, we're going to let him come into heaven. Now what I need you to do is to find that in Scripture and help me understand why you've come to believe that because honestly, it's not in Scripture. In fact, the opposite is there. One label, sinner. Two groups, saved, not saved. If you're saved, the only other category for you is to be in that group that says, Jesus has saved me from my sins because I asked him to. If you're a sinner and you're in the not saved group, you may fall into one of these two. You may be one of those that's saying, I don't need that because I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in everlasting life. I think we all go to the ground to dirt and we don't live any longer than that. Or you could be in that other group where you say, you know, I'm a good person. And God's just going to have to deal with that when I get there. It's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is that we need to come to grips with our sin. And that there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. There are not enough good deeds to outweigh our sin. Because Jesus said there's only one way. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus basically said, I'm the way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you don't get to the Father without being forgiven of your sins. The modern day explanation for sin, for those not in the saved category, is that they're too good for God to send them to hell. Or that they're too bad and they just really don't care. Today, there seems to be little understanding or belief that there is a righteous God who created everything and he hates sin because the sinner is aligned with Satan and their enemies. God hates sin and provides a way of escape for all who will trust Jesus to be saved. God created you because he loves you, but he's going to punish your sin. But fortunately, he's provided a way for you to escape. Remember your survival instincts. Trust Jesus because Jesus loves you. Which of your sins will send you to hell? Any sin slash all sin. One, we're all sinners, all labeled that way. Listen to these verses from Mark chapter 9. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, this sounds harsh, but follow the thinking as Jesus, because he's speaking in hyperbole here, but he's making a point, and it's a strong one, and I don't want you to miss it to get sidetracked. Jesus doesn't want you to mutil, you mutilate the body, but he doesn't want you to go to hell either. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If something in your life causes you to sin, cut it out. It's better for you to enter life crippled than enter eternal life crippled with two hands than with two hands to go to hell. The unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If you do something or if you go somewhere that causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where the worm die, does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus says, you need to get serious about your sin. Don't wait. Don't put it off. It's not going to take care of itself. You know, we're looking for a vaccine or a cure for COVID-19, the coronavirus. I had a pastor friend who texted me and he said, what if we change the word corona and put the word sin there, sin virus? We're looking for a cure and a vaccine for coronavirus. There is a cure for your sin virus. And the cure is Jesus. 
a college freshman went to their dorm laundry room with a, a bundle of dirty clothes. He'd taken his sweatshirt and put all his dirty clothes in the sweatshirt. I'm thankful that I've never done this. Maybe you did it or maybe you would tell that someone you know has. He was so embarrassed for how dirty his clothes were that he never took them out of the wrapped up bundle. He just threw them in the washing machine, put in the soap, put in the money. When he took it out of the washing machine, threw it in the dryer. When he got it out of the dryer, took it up to his dorm room. And when he opened the sweatshirt, what came out? All his dirty clothes. God says, don't keep your sins in a safe little bundle where no one can see them. Because God says, I see them. God says, I want to do a thorough cleansing of your entire life to get rid of all the dirty laundry that is in your life. Jesus is the only cure for your sin virus. Jesus is greater than your sin. Jesus is the way. There's a pastor named Jack Wellman. He's put together some scriptures, and I, I've taken part of what he used and, and, and as a way to help people come to this place of asking Jesus to forgive them of their sins. I've modified it and changed it, but I, I wanted to give him some credit for what I, I borrowed from him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice, practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Everyone is a sinner because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Everyone will receive death as a payment for sin, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your sins made a separation between you and God, and your sins have hidden God's face from you so that he does not hear. God shows his love for you in that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And while you were an enemy, you were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Jesus took care of your sin problem by becoming sin for you. So that you who have repented and trusted in him can be seen as having the same righteousness as Christ does. Not from your good works, but from his. Because he now lives in you, Galatians 2.20. But if not, then you still have the wrath of God on you. I want you to trust Jesus Christ. I want you to repent from your sins, to recognize how God hates your sin. And to turn to him and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Have you done that? Are you ready to do that even now? Wherever you are, watching and listening, this is a time of worship and a time of response. Will you respond to the Word of God? Will you respond to this message? Will you respond to what the Holy Spirit is saying that you need to do right now in your life? Will you say yes to Jesus Christ and ask Him to forgive you of your sin? And to come into your life so that you can say with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're ready to say yes to Jesus, we want you to text yes to the number that's on the screen. Say yes to Jesus We'll follow up with you. You saw Alexis being baptized is a part of this service. We'd love to talk to you about the next steps that you need to take to follow Christ, to receive forgiveness. You don't need to wait till we respond. You can make that decision right now wherever you are and pray and ask him to forgive your sins, and he will do it. If you need help saying yes... Or during this season of life, you need help from some other thing in your life, then text HELP to that number. If God's doing a work in your life and he's prompting you to be a part of this ministry, maybe you're a member, maybe you're not, maybe you're just watching online, but you want to be a part of what God is doing in our church family, and you want to do that in a way that's financial right now. We hope to have other ways for you to do that in the future, but right now financial is one of the main ways you can continue to be a part or start being a part of what God's doing in the life of this church. So we would encourage you to text the word GIVE to that number as God leads and guides in your life, to do that in response to Him. And the last thing we ask you to do is to call. 
that I had a man call from Kentucky last Sunday night and had an incredible visit with him. Just some things he's going through in his life. And we just, we hung out together on the phone, Kentucky and Mississippi. Call us. We have operators standing by. They'd love to take information from you. They'd love to hand you off to someone. They would love to talk to you. They'd love to pray with you to help you say yes to Jesus, to give you some help that you need to answer any questions you have. I want for us in these moments right now to begin to pray as we continue to worship together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for how clear your word speaks that the Lord Jesus came to help us deal with our sin problem. That's why he came. He came so that we could be saved. He came to forgive us of our sins. He came so that we would not have to die. He came so that we can live together forever with Him in heaven. Lord, I pray for those who are part of this worship experience. I pray that they would say yes to Jesus. That they would say no to their sin. And they would ask you for forgiveness right now. overcome sin. We heard the third in a, a series from our pastor, the third message. Jesus is greater than, as Jimmy challenged us to see that Jesus is greater than our sin. There's no sin that he has not overcome. So church family and guests know that we want you to continue to consider this message and there's a sermon discussion and application guide that you can find right there in the Facebook live post if you accessed this video there. Or you can go to our church website, fbcgulfport.org forward slash live, and you can find the discussion guide. More than anything, we want you to know that Jesus is greater than your sin. We want you to know that we are here for you. Please call, connect, and get involved with our virtual life and in person as soon as possible. We remember always that in 1 John 4.4, 4, like Jimmy stated, that Jesus is greater than our sins and he is there for us always. So let's sing together, declare every high.
Thank you.